Thanks again for joining us here at South Suburban Christian Church. If you're joining us for the first time, or the first time in a while, uh, we are in the middle of a series uh, entitled The Gospel, and we're looking through the book of Ephesians. Last week, uh, the message was from Ephesians chapter 1. The sermons don't necessarily build on each other, but there are some connections. And so, uh, if you're uh, not joining us live, I'd encourage you to go and listen to the first message in this series. You can do that uh, by downloading the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Just search South Suburban Christian Church or to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash South Suburban Christian Church. Uh, but if you're here with us live, don't worry about it. Uh, you'll be able to track along as we look at Ephesians chapter 2 today. So if you have your Bibles, uh, I'm going to do this sermon a little bit different. Instead of reading the entire text and then having the message, I'm going to uh, read some of the text, speak about it, some more of the text, speak about it. So Keep your Bibles handy or your tablet or phone or however you read God's Word. Uh, we would uh, appreciate uh, and I pray that it will it'll bless you today. So if you found Ephesians, <clears throat> look at chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse 8. Uh, pretty well-known verses. Any kid that was raised in Sunday school has memorized a couple of Bible verses. Uh, John 3, 16 and 17 and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So... Beginning in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared that we should walk in them. The first uh, point that I want to share with you this morning is, is that the good works that we do are not our good works. I have a good friend who is a militantly non-believing person, physician, uh, highly educated, extremely sharp, uh, and I love him to death, and he loves me in spite of our differences with regard to faith and uh, things eternal, you might say. He sometimes says to me, he says, you know, Ike, he said, I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. And sometimes I want to respond, well, that's not really a very high bar, is it, to, to overcome? But I, I never say that to him. He says, I don't steal. I don't lie. I, don't treat pe- I, I treat people with respect. And I haven't needed God for any of these things. He was quite proud of himself that from his perspective, he had soundly defended his unbelief. His absolute confidence that the purpose of religion was simply to make people better people. Which, of course, is not the purpose of the Christian faith. Now remember what we have been doing uh, thus far in this series and will continue to do as we define the gospel. The gospel is Christ. It is who He is. It is what He has done. And it's how His merits are ours by faith and faith alone. It's not about us. The gospel is nothing to do with us. It's about Him. And as far as we're concerned, the gospel isn't about fixing us necessarily. It's not that God gives us the tools whereby we can make ourselves better people. No, 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 no. The message is, God makes us new. We are a new creation. Now, Scripture reminds us from where we came. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Or 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then, of course, today, Paul talks to us in Ephesians. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But keep reading. Verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's profound. We, you and me, we are God's creation, created in Jesus Christ, the Word. Remember, I've quoted this, I don't know how many times, from John chapter 1, verse 3. All things that were created were created through Him, that is the Word, through Jesus Christ. 
But Paul continues in Ephesians. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. For good works. God has prepared for us to be a blessing to those around us, to the world, to our neighborhoods, to our families, to our household. Now let's think hard back to our high school English class when we had a diagram sentences. Remember that? <sighs> well, if we can do that, if you can remember uh, what it means when we see that word which in the sentence. If we were diagramming it, we would know that that word which is something known as a relative pronoun. My high school English teacher was Mrs. Laws the meanest lady I have ever met, and one of the best teachers I have ever had. When the text uses which, it means that it's referring to an inanimate object, not who, in which case it would be referring to an animate uh, uh, noun or an animate subject. Which, the word which, means it is the good works that were prepared beforehand. And this is true, too, in the original language. So we are His workmanship. And good works are what God prepared beforehand. And the final phrase supports this conclusion when Paul writes that we should walk in them. So here we have this beautiful statement that teaches us that we are both sinners and saints. We have been created by God, and God has done good works, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is, as the good works we do are not our good works, but they are Christ's. Now, remember the gospel, who Christ is, what Christ has done, how his merits are our own by faith and faith alone. The good works we do are Christ's good works. And it is those good works in which we too should walk. Today's text shows us the consequences of the gospel. The consequence is that well, because of the seal of the Holy Spirit, also from last week's message, we are to walk in the good works that Christ has done. Yet the good works that save us are not our own, but those Christ has done for our benefit. You see, it answers some pretty important questions that my non-believing friend doesn't understand. You and I can do all the good works in the world. They are not the good works that make us righteous, especially in God's eyes. Only His works, the works of God the Son, the Son of God, it is His works that make us righteous. And yet at the same time, Paul is telling us, but we walk in them. Because being filled with the Holy Spirit, we can do no other. It is because of what Christ has done that we too can do nothing else but to walk in those same good works as well. Now, I, I know that there is some heavy stuff there, some nuances that are really important. But getting your head wrapped around this will really help organize your life. It will bring joy to your life. Any good I do, it's not me who does it, but Christ who does it for me and through me. The book of James in the New Testament uh, is all about works. And in chapter 1, verse 17, James writes, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of His own will, He brought us forth, 
created, we are his workmanship, by the word of truth, Jesus Christ, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You know, when folks compliment me or our church, and some of you may have heard me say this, one of my, if not my only common response is, is by God's grace and for his glory. And I, I say that really as a reminder to myself that, that it's not my works, it's not our works, it, it, it's not me, it, it's not the institution through which the work of Christ is dependent. It's the reverse. We are dependent upon Christ. The work that is done in this place, or by me, or by you, is really the work of Christ that is done through us. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, well, where's the joy in that? Well, let me tell you. If there is anything that I want to do more, it is I want to be a part. I want to offer my life for Christ's glory. I, I don't want us or I don't want to do things that get affirmation, although my flesh does war against the Spirit in those moments. I don't want to do it for a sense of self-satisfaction. But I just want folks to draw closer to God. He is where your hope is. Not me. Not the institution of the church or the organization even. It is God who is the one who brings full satisfaction in your life. And when you can get that put in the right place, everything else falls into place. And we're going to see this in the coming weeks. Your family, your work, your daily purpose. When God is at the center, when He is the focus, everything else comes into order. I just want the Holy Spirit to work through us. And the same is true as, as, as one of the pastors here at South Sub Church. Any good we do is not we who are doing it. We're already aware of the work God that, that, that God is already doing over the past eight weeks that we have seen magnificent work that, that we never saw coming that has to be God. For us to take upon ourselves things so big that we can't do it alone. Only God can be the one who fulfills that purpose in our life. I pray that as a congregation that we're not interested in rave reviews, but we're interested solely in God being glorified. Point two. Those who are far off will be brought near. Let's pick up reading in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that would be the Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Did you know that there are about 3,000 people mentioned in the Bible? Of those 3,000, only about a few hundred have enough written about them that we get some insight into who they were. The other 2,900 or so, we just have their names. Researchers at Purdue University just finished a comprehensive study combing through ancient documents other than the Bible and have thus far, through extensive cross-referencing, confirmed both the existence and more information about 53 people in the Old Testament. I think that's pretty amazing, especially since the events of the Old Testament, the most recent events of the Old Testament, occurred over 2,500 years ago. Well, I want to tell you about one name in the Old Testament that you may have never heard of when you 
You've read it, I'm sure, but when you read it, you just sort of passed over it, probably a name that you couldn't pronounce, and so we, we just sort of skip those, don't we? Genesis chapter 41 and verse 45, we are introduced to Asenath. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potpharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Well, there you go. A few verses later, we're told that Asenath bore Joseph two sons. And in Genesis 46, verse 20, we discover that those two sons are named Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, that, th those two names may sound a little familiar to you. You've probably heard of the 12 tribes of Israel, named after the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob is one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and some add Joseph as a patriarch. But early on, Joseph, one of Jacob's son, along with his 11 brothers, are mentioned as the 12 sons. And Joseph, rightly so, is mentioned. But by the time the Jews get to the Promised Land, after they have left uh, the oppression of Egypt, the tribe of Levi, the Levites, uh, or the priests, were not permitted to own land. Uh, they lived by receiving one of the three tithes that the people of Israel had to give to the temple and to the priests. So since they can't own land, we're down now to 11 tribes. So in the book of Numbers, instead of listing Joseph as a tribe, they divide his tribe into two, Manasseh and Ephraim. But that division actually goes back to Genesis chapter 48, verses 1 through 7. You might want to make a note of that so you can go back and read that tremendous story. Joseph, as you might remember from Sunday school, has risen to prominence in Egypt. And because of the famine, he's brought his father and his brothers and, his fam and their families all to Egypt so that they can you know, uh, be saved. Now Jacob, the father, is close to death. And Joseph goes to his bed to visit him one last time before he dies, and he takes his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. Well, in Genesis chapter 48, verse 5, we read what the dying Jacob says. Your two sons, he says to Joseph, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. You know, the Message Bible sometimes is a little easier to understand. It's really a paraphrase, but it helps us understand uh, in language that's probably more familiar to us. In the Message version of the Bible, it reads this. Jacob says to Joseph, I'm adopting your two sons who were born to you here in Egypt before I joined you. They have equal status with Reuben and Simeon. Remember last week when we talked about the power of adoption set by the seal, of the notary of the Holy Spirit? Jacob adopts Joseph's two sons. And because of that, he authorizes them and installs them to be equals with Jacob's two oldest sons, Reuben and Simeon. That's pretty powerful. And who was their mother? Asenath. No one ever talks about the mom, do they? Who was Asenath? Well, we've read in other ancient writings, especially writings of the ancient rabbis, about who she was. And she is described, oh, you're going to love this, as one who is far removed from the God of Israel and his ways. Asenath was the daughter of a pagan priest who came into the Hebrew faith and among the Hebrew people through her marriage to Joseph. And from her come two tribes that stand equal with Jacob's eldest son. This mother, who was described as being far off, has now come into the household of Israel and through whom the blessings of God will continue. Now stay with me. Look at verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 2. 
For he himself is our peace, who has, both, uh, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. This is talking about the work of Christ. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Verse 19, So then, You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. My final point for you today is near and far are now the same household. You know, I told you that story about Joseph and Asenath earlier. During the early centuries of the church, in the first few hundred years before the New Testament had been uh, uh, brought together and compiled by the Holy Spirit, canonized and distributed as uh, Scripture, All the early church had was the Old Testament to teach about Christ. And they used the stories of the Old Testament as ways to explain the work of Christ and the work of his church. And so this story about Joseph and Asenath became extremely important. Joseph was cast out by his own family. He suffered at their hands. He was persecuted by foreigners. And yet... He becomes, well, as the ancient church would have said, a shadow of the Messiah. A person who lived before Christ, whose life experiences would shadow or sort of point to what Jesus would do and who Jesus is. And of course, Joseph's wife, Asenath, became an archetype, if you will, of Jesus' bride. And we know who Jesus' bride is, the church. And Asenath, the one who was far removed from God, is a shadow of us, the church, you and me. You see, God is in the business of bringing the far off near. Listening to the ancient church relate this story of Joseph and Asenath to us reminds us of this important point. We all are far off. It isn't that God has brought those who are outside to us who are inside. We all were outside. All of us have been brought near. God doesn't bring folks to us. God brings us and folks to himself. And in so doing, God builds a holy temple, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And man, there it is again, again in chapter 2. God, three in one, one in three. God creates, God prepared, God justifies, God sanctifies. God makes his own dwelling place. And God has chosen you and me. God has chosen us to be the building materials to do that. And so here we are. The gospel is Jesus. It is what He has done and is doing and how His merits become our own through faith alone. God has done great work through us. God is doing great work through us. God will do great work through us in the future. And the best part is that it will happen because with the Holy Spirit empowering us, we can do nothing else but walk in 
them. The gospel isn't what we're going to do. The gospel is about what God has already done and is doing. It's not about, oh my goodness, we better do this, this, and this, although we'll have those conversations. It's really what the gospel really says to us is we can't do anything else but walk in the good works that God has called us to. And I don't know about you, but I am so overwhelmed and so excited to be a part of what God and God alone is doing. How about you? <laughs> now, I know some of this was hard. And, and even getting our heads wrapped around how we relate to all of this, it's difficult for a lot of folks. And I think one of the reasons is because it's about surrender. Now, I know some of you are going to keep fighting. Some of you are going to resist Paul's message in Ephesians, and you're going to say, I know I can do it. I can uh, be the best person I can be. I'm going to make my life the best life that I know I can make it to be. But when you get done doing that, you're going to be just as miserable as you are now. My brother, my sister, you got to let you got to let go of the control that you're seeking, that you're worshiping. God's got this. I don't know about for all of you, and I'm speaking now just to my brothers here. Brothers, you've got to surrender. Bow the head, bend the knee. Surrender your heart, your mind, your life to God. And allow Him to take you by the arm and raise you up. And do the good work that you know your family needs, that you know your place of business needs, that you know your church needs, that this community needs. My sister, I know the whole world is pressing down on your shoulders. And I know that you think that everything depends on you. And all that's going to do is break you. It's God who will do it through you. And all the mess-ups, it's just a part of it. And sometimes, both to my brothers and sisters, our refusal to relinquish control in our lives and our insistence to do things our way, one of the ways that God keeps trying to get you where he knows you need to be is to show you how relentless and how undoable all of that is. Stop today. Open your heart. Open your life. And let God's good works flow through you. It'll make all the difference in the world. Will you pray with me? Lord, we confess that too often we accept the weight of making the world a better place on our own shoulders. And time and time again through your word, you have said only God can do that. Only you can do that, Father. May we surrender our lives to you this day. May we surrender our family, our work, our marriages, our children, our church, our neighborhoods, our nation, our world. May we surrender it to you today. That your good work, that your perfect work, will flow through us. In Christ's name, amen. If you've made the decision today to make Christ Lord of your life, if you surrender today, would you go to our website at southsuburban.com? At the bottom of the page, there is a little box that says next steps. Click on that. 
It'll talk to you. We're, we're going to share with you a little bit about how life is going to change for you as you begin this new life in Christ. If you want to talk to me or to one of our elders, please email us at office at southsuburban.com. We really want to be the vehicle through which God is glorified and you are drawn closer to Him. Until we meet again, God bless you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Also, share the video. For more information about our church, please go to southsuburban.com.